in the church house this morning with you. I want you, if you will, to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 16. We might take a look at a few other scriptures throughout the course of the message, but I'm going to take the main text out of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And I'm going to start reading at verse number 13. We'll go to verse 24. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Say amen when you're there. Amen. One of the things that I find myself praying for, I, I talk with a lot of people, I counsel with several different people, and you'd be surprised at how many people suffer from addictions in their lives. Addictions are very, very hard I mean, without the Holy Spirit, without being saved, you about don't have a chance of beating an addiction. I suppose it has been done, and it can be done, but your battle with addictions outside of Jesus Christ is very hard. There are those who are inside of Jesus Christ and have addictions in their life. And I want to talk to you today about that very thing. I want to talk to you about addictions. You, you might be sitting there right now and thinking, Pastor Thad, what in the world are you coming up with today? There's bad addictions. We're going to maybe just pinpoint some here in just a few moments. But how many of you understand and know that there's also good addictions? Amen? How many of you know that 1 Corinthians chapter 16 pinpoints that very thing that there is? Good addiction. Have you read this chapter close enough to know what to know already what it is that I'm talking about? I remember not too well. It's been several years now. Me and another minister, uh, we were uh, we were getting ready to do an Easter service together. Uh, the pastor of the church had fallen sick; he wasn't there, and the elders called me and said, "You're on the call list, and the pastor's not able. Can you come?" And I said, "I'll be there, but..." Unbeknownst to the ones that called me, another group of them called another minister and said, our pastor's under the weather and can't be here today, so can you come? And so two ministers showed up to do one service. That was uh, that was something else. And anyway, it was an Easter service, and, uh, and so we had decided that we would share the, share the pulpit, and we were going to, uh, we were going to talk about uh, nailing our sins to the cross. And before the service had started, we went back into the pastor's study where we joined together in prayer for the service that was about to come and and he and I had decided that we would write our sins on a piece of paper and be the first to nail them to the cross. So I'm writing and I'm writing and I'm writing and he starts laughing. He said, you're going to get writer's cramp. <laughs> uh, then he wrote his down on a piece of paper but he reached in his pocket and he had a lighter. I first said, what are you doing with a cigarette lighter? And he said, well, I'm writing that on my list. And I said, why are you burning your list? He said, because I don't want you to know what's on it. Sometimes we live our lives that way. We don't want people to know what's on our list. But can I tell you, the Holy Spirit knows what's on our list. It doesn't matter if we write it down on a piece of paper and nail it to a cross or if we reach into our pocket and grab a lighter and burn it. The Holy Spirit knows what's on our list. And so today, I want to talk about a few of those things, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to go after it in the light of uh, bad addictions. I want to go after it in the light of good addictions. Read with me, if you will, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'm going to start in verse 13. One of the things that I like about reading 1 and 2 Corinthians is the awesome teaching that is laid out uh, for a church body. And certainly there's some of that laid out here. The scripture says, watch me. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Let all your things <laughs> be done with charity. What is this saying to us? As, as the Corinthians waited Paul's next visit, they were directed to want to be alert. It says to watch ye. In other words, be alert. We need to be alert at all times, friends. Because we're living in a day and an age that is not following, is not walking, and does not care for the Word of God. 
They, are, they will rewrite it. They will, they will try to debunk it. They will do everything in their power possibly that they can do to get our eyes off of doing what's right according to the scripture. And I'll tell you what, the Bible even tells us in the end times that if it were possible, if it were possible, the false prophets would even fool God's very elect. It's so easy to become deceived today. I absolutely refuse to be one who deceives myself. And the only way that we can keep from being deceived by a false message, by a false prophet, is to understand the Word of God ourselves and on our own. Amen. We need to spend time reading what God has written down. So many times people say, I wish the Lord would just speak to me. Well, He has, and He does. He does it through His Word. And all you got to do is pick up the Bible, open it up, and read it. That's God speaking to you. If you're listening to God, and if you're if you're if you're if you're quote unquote addicted to the Word of God, then when the false prophets rise and begin to preach a false message, and they'll do it with just enough truth. So what if you don't know the Scripture for yourself? They can hook you like a catfish and reel you in. There is just enough truth in their false messages to deceive people, but the Scripture teaches us. That we are to watch. In other words, we're to be alert. Don't let these things befall you. It says to stand fast in the faith. In other words, it says, it says to, uh, to, to stand true to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now over the last several weeks, over the last year really, and upcoming within these next couple of weeks, you're going to see those who are, who are standing faithful to their politics. You're going to see those who are standing faithful to their candidates. You're going to see those who are standing faithful to who they want you to vote for. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could stand faithful to our Lord the same way with the same vigor that so many people are standing faithful to their candidates today? Wouldn't it be wonderful if all we heard about is, is the goodness and the mercy of God, but every time we turn on a television, listen to a radio, or pick up the newspaper, we see somebody else quoting something else that Jesus said. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, I might actually enjoy listening to the news if that were if that were the case, but certainly, sadly, it is not. But the scripture is teaching us not only are we to be watchful, not only are we to be alert, but it's also teaching us that we are to stand true for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The scripture here says to uh, quench you like men. In other words, to behave maturely. My goodness. <laughs> That's a message that needs to be preached in our pulpits again. We've got grown men and grown women who are acting like they're 15 or 16 years old. I'm going to tell you, I can't even pull that off. I can't even pull that off if I wanted to. Uh, if I tried to dress like I dressed when I was 15 years old, you guys would look at me and say, what? Well, he's having a midlife crisis, you know? <laughs> and there's something wrong with Pastor Thad. He's not acting like Pastor Thad. He's not dressing like Pastor Thad. He's not speaking like Pastor Thad. And sometimes it's all done in jest. And you say, yeah, Pastor, it's just in fun. But hear me today. I think God wants us to have fun. I think God wants us to fellowship. I think God wants us to enjoy the life that we have. But I also know the Word of God expects us to act as mature Christians. And to be quite honest with you, there's a lot of things that are happening in our world today that are pulling us out of our maturity zones and our maturity levels and are causing us to act more and more like little children. The Scripture teaches us that we are to behave maturely. That's what it means when it says, quit you like men. The scripture teaches us to be strong. And lastly, it tells us to do all things with kindness and love. My goodness. Wouldn't it be a wonderful world if everybody did what they do in kindness? If everybody did what they do in love? Our experience at checkout counters might be a little bit differently if we walked in kindness than if we worked in love. Our experience at drive through lanes might be a lot more better if we acted in kindness and if we acted in love. Well, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but that's good teaching for a church. And I believe that those are the things that we need to be listening to. I think those are the things that we need to be teaching. And I certainly believe that those are the things that we need to become addicted to. Watch you stand fast in faith. Put you like man, be strong. Let all your things be done in charity. Verse 15, I beseech you, brethren. Pay close attention now. I beseech you, brethren. You know the house of Stephanas. 
that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have, what's that word? Addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. It just threw me for a loop when I saw that word. When I was studying this out this morning, taking a look at the word of God, asking the Lord, what would you have me to speak on? What would you have me to teach? I saw this word. That they were addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And we're going to come back and pay a little bit closer attention, but I want to finish the reading. That you submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth us, helpeth with us in labor. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortanus and Achaeus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied, for they have refreshed my spirit in yours. Therefore, acknowledge ye them that are such. The churches of Asia salute you, Aquila and Priscilla salute you in in much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. If any man loveth not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Did you notice in verse number 15, he said, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanas, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Did you notice that word addict? Did it stand out to you like it did to me? <coughs> People are addicted to many things in this world. They're addicted to liquor. They're addicted to alcohol. They're addicted to coffee. <laughs> How many... <laughs> How many of you, how many of you would, would make the statement, listen, don't talk to me until I've had my second cup? You know what? I've actually seen that printed on coffee cups before. Don't talk to me until I've had my second. There's so many people that cannot get started. And I'm going to tell you what, with myself, if I wake up in the morning and don't get a couple of cups of coffee in me, I'll have a horrible headache by afternoon. Now that... And we put name tags on addictions like we put name tags on sin. Well, I'm not a murderer, so I'm not that bad, but I, I suffer with pride a little bit, so my pride's not as bad as murder, so we're going to put murder in this category, we're going to put pride in this category. Um, I'm not a thief, I wouldn't steal anything from anybody, so we're going to put, we're going to put thievery on this side in this category, because it's a really horrible, bad sin. I'm just a little bit jealous. That's not nearly as bad as thievery, so we're going to put jealousy over here on this side. And we put name tags on those. But can I tell you something? Sin is sin. Amen. And it doesn't matter what name tag you put it on, all sin will be judged by Jesus Christ. And if sin is the only thing that will keep us out of heaven, then does it really matter how big or how small a sin is? All sin is sin, and all sin needs to be forgiven. All sin needs to be put under the blood of Jesus Christ. We can look that way with addictions as well. Well, I'll get a horrible headache by the end of the afternoon if I don't have two cups of coffee, but I'm not addicted to alcohol, so I'm okay. There's several types of addictions. Do you know people are addicted to approval? It doesn't even have to be a, it doesn't even have to be a chemical thing. There's some people that are addicted to approval. We seek men's approval on every step that we take. When really what we need to be doing is seeking God's approval with every step that we take. Folks are addicted to cigarettes. Some folks are addicted to food. I always tell people that I love to eat. The Lord is good at cooking, so God knows what he was doing when he put the two of us together. But some people are absolutely addicted to food. Some folks are addicted to sports. <laughs> you know, the Cubs fans are really getting their face today. The KBC's in full Cub attire this morning. So, uh, you know, some folks are addicted to, to sports. And other folks are addicted to television. Folks are addicted to drugs. People are addicted to so many different kinds of things this morning. But today I want to, I want to confess and I want to point out, I want to point out three addictions that 
that I believe we all need to have in our lives. As the scripture says, I am addicted to the ministry of the saints. And I want to read that to you again. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanas, that is the first fruits of Achaia, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I am absolutely, and it's my hope and it's my prayer this morning, that you too are addicted to the ministry of the saints. I just absolutely love to gather together and to worship with you. I love your worship. I love to worship. I love to lift my voice. I love to praise Jesus Christ. I love to hear the testimonies of the people who say, we've been praying for my cousin Jack, and lo and behold, he got his word back, and there is no cancer left in him. And to hear the whole church clap their hands and say, praise God, wonderful God that we serve, powerful God that we serve. Not only does he hear our prayers, but he answers our prayers. We serve a mighty God, and as we come together collectively on Sunday morning, I'm almost addicted to being here and gathering together with you here because I love your worship. Uh, I don't like to miss church. I don't miss church because I don't want to miss church. Amen? It's not a natural thing for a Christian to just lay home in front of the television set and do absolutely nothing. Being in church is, for a Christian, that's like being in their element. And so I, I'm addicted to worship. And I'm addicted to your worship. I'm addicted to it when we all come together and we're all focused on one thing and one thing only. And that is lifting up the name of Jesus Christ and receiving something substantial from the Word of God. That ought to make you want that so badly that nothing could keep you out of the house of the Lord. As we, as we think about this, the, I want you to know that, that not only am I addicted to your worship, but I'm addicted to your work. I'm addicted to the work of the ministry. I don't want to be a spy. I don't want to be a pew center. I want to say, Lord, give me something to do. I want to share something with you. This is uh, found in the Gospel of Luke. Now listen to this. Just listen to this. This is Luke chapter 10. Verse number two says this. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. We are living in a time that Christ was talking about. There's a harvest out there, friend. There's work that needs to be done. There are people in our world today who are thirsting and hungering for the truth. They've been confused for so long because this side says one thing and this side says another. And everybody is saying something different. And there is no truth to grab a hold of any longer. But we have people who are willing to accept God for who He is. They're willing to accept Jesus Christ for who He is. But the thing is, they haven't heard the truth in so long that they don't know what to grab a hold of. I'm speaking of our younger people. Those of you who are of my age group or older, we've got a little bit of silver in our hair. Things for us were black and white. Growing up, I remember, I remember growing up, even if you didn't receive Christ to be your Lord and your Savior, you still knew that He was the Son of God. Even if you weren't living a committed life to serving God, you still knew that God was sovereign. You believed in a heaven. You believed in a hell. You believed that those who were in Christ Jesus would go to heaven. You believed those who rejected Christ Jesus would go to hell. You knew the Word. You knew the Bible was God's Word. You didn't question that. You didn't doubt that. Not everybody received it, but everybody knew it. And so if you reach the point in your life, like I did, when I said, I no longer want to be who it is that I am. I don't, there's got to be something more to this. I had a solid foundation of the truth that I could reach out to and grab a hold of. Our young folks today, 18, 19, 20, 35 years old, They've been so confused for so long because the world that Grandma and Grandpa talk about, the world that Mom and Dad talks about, is no longer the world that they are living in. <laughs> 
And it happened years ago when we got away from old-fashioned Bible teaching, when we got away from the Scripture and started trying to win the world. Which might be another message for another day. I don't want to get too caught up in that, but here's what I'm trying to get to you. There is a harvest out there, white for the picking, as the scripture teaches. But the laborers are few. Jesus, Jesus said to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into his harvest. That should be our prayer today. We should be so addicted to the ministry of God. We should be so addicted to the word of God. We should be so addicted to the power of the Holy Spirit to change a person's life that we should not just be comfortable saying, I want to be a peer center. We ought to be saying, Lord, give me something to do. I'm thankful today for that few. I'm thankful today for the few who are willing to step out of the church into a work field or to step out of the church into a neighborhood and live Monday through Saturday the way we worship on Sunday. You don't have to put a Bible under your arm and build a pulpit and take it along with you and preach a message everywhere you go. You just need to let the Word of God be alive and well inside your heart to the point that it leads you and guides you and, and helps you to make the decisions and speak the words that you speak. We need laborers into this harvest who will have the faith to live out what we say we believe. Because when we live out what we say we believe, then someone can see the power of our Lord and say, I want that too. You know, the scripture teaches of a time when there was a man who was sick of the palsy. And he was born at four on a, on a bed or a cot or whatever. I don't know. But they, these four men were determined. Were determined. I said, see, I messed that up. He said, man, I'm not even sure they were men. But there were four people. Four people who put this man who was sick of the palsy on a cot of some sort of stretcher. And carried him to the place where Jesus is. But when they got there... The place was surrounded by people to the point that they could not get him in physically to where Jesus was at. I've preached this and taught this. Some of you know the very words I'm going to speak. But I'm afraid that we, I'm afraid that we get so used to the word that we miss the message sometimes. So I'm going to revisit this. When they got there, they were not able to get their friend who was sick of the palsy inside the house where Jesus was. So they busted a hole in the roof and lowered him down at Jesus' feet. When Jesus saw him and saw their faith, he said to the man who was sick of the palsy, Rise up, take up thy bed and walk. <laughs> John 
6, 66 through 68 says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye go away also? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So oftentimes we are so numb to the preaching that we wind up missing the message. I can't tell you how many times when I was a young man and we would go to church and, 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 and I'd run into Brother Taylor throughout the course of the week and on purpose he would say, Son, what did I preach about Sunday morning? One time I said, well, I don't know. It's only Thursday. Sunday ain't here yet. I thought I was going to get by with something. He said, what did I preach about last Sunday? I said, I've got to be honest with you. I don't know. And it always brought a sense of conviction in my heart. Here's the thing, folks. I understand and I know you can't always remember everything that was preached, every message that has ever been preached in your presence. Here's what you need to understand. I can't, I can't remember. I couldn't tell you what Laura cooked me for supper last Tuesday to save my life. But I can tell you it was good. And I can tell you I nourished my body. And I can tell you I'm no longer sick. I can tell you, I, I can tell you that it did what it needed to do. And I can also tell you that I love Laura's cooking, except for how many of you are friends with us on Facebook? This is just a little sidebar here. Don't have a whole lot to do with the message. Maybe a little bit, but I see a couple of hands. She posted on Facebook the other day that she was going to cook dill pickle soup. I told her, I said, listen, I love all kinds of pickles. I love sweet pickles. I love bread and butter pickles. I love hamburger pickles. I love dill. I love all kinds of pickles. And I love all kinds of soup. Chili soup and vegetable soup and chicken noodle soup. But I don't think you're supposed to take pickles and soup and mix them together and call them pickle soup. <laughs> so if you happen to make that, I'm not positive I'm going to eat that. <laughs> but I'll also tell you, if you do make that, I am going to forget that one either. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's the thing. We might not always remember everything that our wives cook us for, or, or your mom's cook you for, for supper on any given day, but we know it's good. And we know that it's nourished our bodies. <coughs> and there's times when I get off of work, I just about can't drive that truck fast enough to get home so I can sit down and eat supper. And that's how we need to be with the message of God's Word. We need to love the message of God's Word to the point where it causes us to be driven to hear it again and hear it again and hear it again. And the message of God's Word is there is hope. The message of God's Word the message of God's word is there is salvation. And that comes through and by his son, Jesus Christ. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. It was fulfilled in the New Testament. Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the truth and I'm the life. And no man will come unto the Father but by me. That is the message of the word of God. That there's salvation, there's hope, and there's redemption. As we read in the scripture, after Jesus was crucified, after he was buried, that were on the road to Emmaus. Let me, let me turn to this. Let me turn to this. I want to share something with you. This is so profound. Luke chapter 24. This is so profound. This is going to bless you. This is going to bless you. I don't know if you're enjoying my message this morning, but that's alright. I'm enjoying it today. Matthew 24, 29. Now Christ had walked with these two. And they walked together and they talked together. And he wanted to know why were they so sad? What was going on? And they said, well, don't you know what has happened in Jerusalem? They've, they've, they've crucified Jesus Christ. And went on and on and said, besides this, this was the third day. You know how the scripture goes. I want you to take a look at this. Matthew 24, I'm going to start at verse number Verse number 28. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further, but they constrained him. These two disciples who were walking with Christ but didn't know they were walking with Christ. They constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. 
And so he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he said and meet with them, here's what he did in their presence. Now keep in mind, keep in mind up to this point, these two disciples, they knew who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. They knew who he was. Before he was crucified, they knew who he was. When Jesus turned water into wine, they probably were there. When Jesus spoke the words to Lazarus to raise from the dead, they were probably there. When Jesus performed the miracles, healing blinded eyes and opening deaf and ears, when Jesus would preach so powerful messages that thousands would come and he'd have to back up and stand in the back of someone's boat because they were pressing against him. They were there. They knew Jesus. They walked with him. They talked with him. They slept with him. They ate with him. They knew who he was. But yet, as they walked down the road to Emmaus, dismayed, discouraged, and heartbroken, Christ come alongside them and are walking with them. Yet they didn't know Him at that point. I've heard a lot of different explanations for it. I don't want to get into that because that's not what I'm trying to teach you today. What I am trying to teach you is we can see by the Scripture that Christ was walking with them and they knew not that it was him. And so when all of this had happened, it came night time, and Christ was going to depart from them, but they constrained him. In other words, they stopped him. They said, no, don't go on. It's getting late. We've all walked a long way. It's time to sit down and enjoy a meal. Stay with us. Now listen to this. And he went in to tarry with them. Verse number 30. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he, who? Jesus, took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. Where else have you seen that picture? Where else have you seen that picture of Jesus taking the bread, blessing it, breaking it, and giving it to them? Well, he did that. He did that when he did that when they were going to feed five thousand. Remember? Yeah. And he multiplied it, and, and everybody got to eat. And the disciples took up twelve baskets full. And that always blesses me too. How many disciples were there? Twelve. How many baskets did they take up? Twelve. Make no mistake. When you get addicted to the Word of God, when you get addicted to the service of God, there's going to be enough for you. He'll bless you. Oh, another message for another day. So we've seen that there. Now, we also see when they were in the upper room together the night before Jesus was crucified, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. Now, at this point, in this instance, when they were walking with him and talking with him all day long and sharing from their heart how distraught they were and how heartbroken they were and how discouraged Jesus listening to them and beginning at Moses uh, went through the word of God preaching himself. When they got to this point and broke the bread, boom, their eyes were opened. And they knew. And they knew. Look at it. Don't take my word for it. It's there. And it came to pass as he said with them and meat that he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. What does that got to do with your message of being addicted to things of the Lord today, That has a lot to do with the message of being addicted to the things of the Lord today. Because sometimes we get so dull of hearing the message that we wind up missing it. Sometimes we get so caught up in, in doing church that we miss the message. Sometimes we get so caught up in life that we miss the message. So often times we are walking hand in hand down this road called life with Christ. And we miss the message that He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He'll go with us all the way even to the end of the world. Through your financial difficulties, He's there. But we miss the message. Through your health crisis, He's there. But we miss the message. As you look upon your wayward children who need to come back to the Lord and your heart is broken and your mind is troubled and you're losing sleep, we fail to... See the message. He's there. He's there. We may not always see him. We may not always recognize him. But make no mistake. He's there. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord.
the name of the Lord. Don't miss the message, friend. I'm so addicted to the message of the scriptures. Don't miss the message. Don't miss the message. And the last thing I want to point out to you is I'm addicted to the movement of the Spirit. You see, when the Spirit moves, when we come together collectively in one mind and in one accord, first of all, let me get basic. Let me get basic. Let me get basic. How many of you have ever said on your way to church, well, I hope the Spirit shows up today. I'm really looking forward to a Spirit-filled service. Um, if you're really saying that, then we need to pray that you could get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. Because if you're in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is in you, then you have the Spirit. So as you enter into this building that's made with brick and mortar, not even brick and mortar, this was made of metal and, and wood. When you enter into this building, the Spirit enters it. This isn't where the Spirit lives and dwells. The Spirit lives and dwells inside you and inside the heart of every born again believer. So when you show up, naturally the Spirit shows up. Okay? So when you show up and I show up and we are both in agreement on the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we're in agreement that the word of God is the truth, when we're in agreement that he's worthy to be praised, when we're in agreement that we're going to lift up our voices and worship him today in spirit and truth, when we come together in agreement, or as the scripture teaches us, in one mind and in one accord, then the spirit will begin to move as it did on the day of Pentecost and fill the whole house. And we will feel it as it is a great rushing mighty wind. And, and, and when the Spirit begins to move in the church house and goes from heart to heart and pew to pew and touches each and every one of us, when the Spirit moves, people get convicted and lost souls get saved. When the Spirit moves, the drawing power of God hits people and they get drawn church you're from 
Listen, I'm not teaching you that you got to jump out of the pew and raise hands and shout. That's how I was accustomed to it. But you can be in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus can be in you. And you can sit down right like this and say, in your heart, oh my goodness, Holy Spirit moved that way in my life. I praise you this morning, Lord, for your Holy Spirit because the preacher's right, your spirit is power. You might not ever sit up off your pew. You might not ever raise a hand, but you open your heart to true worship and praise and adoration. And you're allowing the Holy Spirit to do in you what the Holy Spirit wants to do in you. And you need to be addicted to it. You need to be just absolutely addicted to the ministry. You need to be absolutely addicted to the Word. You need to be absolutely addicted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to be absolutely addicted to the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it's the power of the Holy Spirit in the heart of a true believer that will make the changes that need to be made. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care what you're. I don't care what you're facing at work. I don't care what you're facing with your retirement. I don't care what you might be facing in school, around your friends. You allow the Holy Spirit to be your lead and your guide, and you won't be led wrong. So I wonder today, what are we addicted to? What are we addicted to? Is it coffee? Is it television? Is it the Cubs? Amen. Listen, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad today, too, that the Cubs are World Series. I didn't think I would ever live long enough to see that. But, you praise the Lord. What are you addicted to? What are you addicted to? There's, there's some things that we need to be addicted to. I feel like I preached my message this right here. Close our eyes. I wonder if there's one or more of you here in our presence. You have never received Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. Maybe you've never repented of your sin. Maybe you've never asked for, for forgiveness and salvation. We would love to give you the opportunity this morning. Pastor Ted, there's a lot of things in my life that are important to me. Some things that I'm even drawn to, maybe even addicted. Today I realized I really want Jesus to be one of those. I want Jesus to be the thing. I've never asked the Lord into my heart, and I want to do that today, Pastor Dad. Is there one more of you here today that would say I'm lost, but I don't want to die that way? That will lead me to the throne of grace. I'm going to tell you this song. You know me. I'm going to pray here in just a moment. But I'm going to give a lost soul a chance to make his way home. Is there one or more? Okay, maybe you are here today and you are saved. But, when you love the Lord, you know you've been forgiven. I'm, this is going to be challenging. I want you to know there's nobody looking around right now. Nobody can see you. I just, I just want to minister to you and I want to help you. I want to pray with you. I am saved, Pastor, but church just doesn't seem, I don't know what's going on with me. I'm kind of dry. Church just doesn't seem that important to me. I, I really want to be addicted to it. I, 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 I want to get so involved. I want to get, I want to get reconnected. I want to get in. I want to start working. Is there one more of you here we can pray for? I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to love you. Is there one more of you here today? Let's say I'm struggling with that. And I want to, I want to. I want to be set on fire again. Just yearn to attend church. Bless your heart. Is there another? Maybe you're, maybe you're here today. Maybe you're here today. And you're one that you're one that you know the promise of God that Jesus said to never leave you and never forsake you. But there's often times in your life you're walking down the road and you're experiencing things and they bother you and they trouble you. And you just don't always see Christ in the mix. Until it just makes it so absolutely obvious and then you feel horrible and you have to ask him to forgive you for it. And you're saying, Pastor Dad, I don't want to miss the message anymore. I'm going to see him in all things. You know, I see you. Praise the name. I see you and I see you and I see you and I see you. 
Maybe today you're one that struggles with following the Holy Spirit. You know, there was a time in my life I had received Jesus Christ, but I hadn't yet fully trusted Him with every aspect of my life. I felt like I needed to be in the mix. I felt like my hands needed to be in everything. And I'm so grateful to know that God doesn't really need my help. It took a long time for me to be able to just trust in the Holy Spirit, but it was liberating when I did. Maybe you're here today, and you're one of those who... This whole teaching, this whole idea of being led by the Spirit and living by the Spirit is something I just struggle with, Dad. But today, I see you, and I see you. And I see you. Father God, I want to come to you this morning, and I thank you, Lord, for every soul that is in this church house this morning by their own admission. They've testified that they've received you to be their Lord and their Savior, and that blesses me. Father, today's message is a challenging message because it, it deals with so many aspects in our lives. There are those in this congregation this morning, Lord, that the message has touched. So many people have raised their hands for one point or another. For the one, Lord, that for the one, Lord, that is struggling with coming to church, we just, we just thank you, Lord, for that one. We just ask, Lord, that you would, uh, that you would, that you would examine the heart, Lord, that you would encourage, and that you would set that fire in that heart once again, Lord, to be, to be attached to the church fellowship and to the, to the ministry of the church. We pray for the many hands that rose up this morning, Lord, that said that they don't want to no longer miss the message. I want to see you in everything. Lord, that could be a hard thing. That could be a challenging thing. But there were many of the folks that said, Pastor Thad, that's, that's what I got out of the message today. And pray for me so today. Lord, I'm going to pray for every hand that rose um, over that request. And then, Lord, there were many others who said that they struggled with turning their life wholly over to following the Holy Spirit. That was a struggle of mine, Lord. And I praise you that you brought me to a place that I was able to. So today, Lord, I ask that you'd have mercy upon those. And Lord, that you would have grace upon those. And that you'd help them along the way and encourage them and let them know, Lord, that they can trust every step that they take to the Holy Spirit. Help us today, Lord, as we leave this place and go home. Uh, keep this message alive inside our hearts, Lord. And I pray that it would bring forth its fruit. Father, I love these people, each and every one. And I know that you do too. So I'm going to ask you once again, Lord. Keep them all safe from harm's way. Bring us back at our next appointed time. And once again, we can worship you in spirit and in truth. All honor, glory, worship, and praise we give unto thee. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.